good afternoon today's talk will be the second part of my talk on mary shelley's novel frankenstein when mary shelley subtitled her novel the modern prometheus she perhaps forcefully directed our attention to the book's critique both of the promethean poets she knew best like byron and a husband passed by shelley and of the entire romantic ideology as she understood it victor frankenstein the character in the novel and his failure to mother his child has both political and serious ramifications and that is what mary wants us perhaps to understand and victor frankenstein's quest is nothing less than the quest of death itself by acquiring the ability to bestow animation upon lifeless matter and thus renew life where death had apparently devoted the body to corruption frankenstein in effect hopes to become god the creator of life and the gratefully worshiped father of a new race of immortal beings in his attempt to transform human beings into deities by eliminating mortality victor frankenstein is himself participating in the mythopoetic vision that inspired the first generation of romantic poets and thinkers for example we are reminded of william blake who had once insisted that the human form could become divine through the exercise of mercy pity love and imagination even coleridge had stated that human perception of the primary imagination is an echo of the infinite i am wordsworth had argued that the higher minds of poets are truly from the deity quote and quote while both godwin and his disciple percy by shelley had proclaimed that man was perfectible in their view the right use of reason and imagination could annihilate or defeat not only social injustice and human evil but even through participation in symbolic thinking or what blake called divine analogy the consciousness of human finitude and death itself therefore in this novel of mary shelley victor frankenstein's goal can be identified with the radical desire that energized some of the best known english romantic poems the desire to elevate human beings into living gods in identifying victor frankenstein with prometheus mary shelley was alluding to both versions of the prometheus myth one version of which posits prometheus as a plasticator of sorts and the other version posits prometheus as orpheus in the first version known to Mary Shelley through Ovid's Metamorphosis, which she read in 1815, Prometheus created man from clay, and as Ovid says, and I quote, whether the particles of heavenly fire, the god of nature, did his soul inspire, or earth but new divided from the sky, and mind still retained the ethereal energy, which wise from Prometheus tempered into paste, and mixed with living streams the godlike image cast from such root principles our form began and art was metamorphosed into man in the alternate the more famous version perhaps of the prometheus myth as we know is where prometheus is the fire stealer the god who defied jupiter's tyrannical oppression of humanity by giving fire to man and was then punished by having his entrails eaten by vultures until he divulged the secret for knowledge of Jupiter's downfall by the 3rd century AD these two versions had effectively fused into one the fire stolen by prometheus became the fire of life with which he animated his men of clay as both the creator and or the savior of man and the long suffering rebel against tyranny 
Prometheus was often an invoked self-image among the romantic poets. Blake visually identified his heroic rebel and the spokeswoman Utho with the torture Prometheus in his design for the plate titled Visions of the Daughters of Albion, while Coleridge's ancient marine recalls Prometheus both in his translation of an established moral order and in his perpetual suffering that he may teach mankind to be both sadder and wiser. Prometheus as a self-portrait of the artist who had liberated himself from serving dull idol gods and instead who rejoices in his own creative powers. Mary Shelley specifically associated her modern Prometheus with the romantic poet she knew personally. During the summer in which she was she began writing Frankenstein, Byron composed his poem Prometheus, a celebration of the god's defiance, as it were, of Jupiter, which emphasizes Prometheus's unyielding will, noble suffering, his tolerance, and his concern for mankind, qualities which Byron clearly identified himself with. Mary Shelley copied this poem and carried it to Byron's publisher, John Murray, when she returned to England in August 1816. Byron's Promethean persona appeared again in Manfred, which Mary Shelley read soon after its publication on June 16, 1870. Manfred's Faustian thirst for unbounded experience, knowledge, and his love for freedom leads him, like Victor Frankenstein, to steal the secrets of nature. Above all, Mary Shelley associated her modern Prometheus with Percival Shelley, who had already, already announced his desire to compose an epic rebuttal to his Skyless's Prometheus bound when he read it, the play in 1816, although it's significant and we need to remember it that he did not begin writing Prometheus Unbound until September 1818, that is after Frankenstein with that alternate title was actually published. Essentially, Frankenstein is not what it was meant to be as a novel. Both Percy's 1818 preface and Mary's 1831 introduction describe in detail the occasion of the composition of Frankenstein. The Shelleys, that is Percy and Mary, had been reading German ghost stories with two friends, Byron and Polidori, and the group had agreed that each would write one story of their own. And the reports are very explicit. The preface, for example, of the 1818 version speaks of a story founded on some supernatural occurrence, quote-unquote. And the introduction of 1831 relates how frustrated Mary uh, went when she was trying to conceive a ghost story. And she speaks of my tiresome, unlucky ghost story. The story beginning with the most tiresome cliches in the books, quote-unquote, it was on a dreary night of November, was the short tale of the monster's creation that became chapter 5 in the final version of the novel. The way the rest of the novel shapes its core tale, however, is something else, something more connected and perhaps less amazing. Mary describes a process of composition aimed at constructing a possible chain of events preceding and succeeding the central nightmare. She says, and I quote, Everything must have a beginning, and that beginning must be linked to something that went before." Unquote. Her three narrators, the explorer Walton, who seeks a passage to the North Pole despite all physical and human resistance, the scientist Frankenstein, who is irresponsibly creates a living being, then dishonors his solemn promise to create a partner, and the monster, who lacks nurture and self-control, are emotionally disordered, but they are not mad. There is another critical issue that needs examination in Mary Shelley's Frankenstein. 
If the novel is said to be supernatural, as many of the initial readers or critics have approached the novel to be, then what is supernatural about the plot of Frankenstein? Or where does the supernaturalism in Frankenstein lie? Originally, the word supernatural was a religious term referring to gods and angels, and the religious or mythic sublime persists in discussions of the Gothic novel as well, as in the work of Wilton Day. Sometimes in Frankenstein, supernatural does mean magical, as it regularly does, for example, in the works of Radcliffe and Godwin, but this was still probably not the common sense of the term, at least. The earliest ambiguous instance of this sense recorded in the Oxford English Dictionary comes from Walter Scott in 1830. Until then, the word seems typically to have implied exceeding rather than violating in Kantian terminology, a mathematical rather than a dynamic sublime. So at first appearance, a monster is said to be of a gigantic nature, quote unquote, at eight feet, though indeed Mary Shelley speaks of seven or eight feet in the original manuscript uh, that was evident in the notebook. We would have to call it impressive rather than titanic. The monster does leap across vast chasms of ice and is capable of scaling the overhanging sides of Mont Salif. It runs with greater speed than the flight of an eagle, for example, or with more than mortal speed, as Mary Shelley says. As he says at another, yet it's hard to know exactly how much to credit these turns of phrase. When wrestling with Felix de Lacy, the monster reports being grabbed with supernatural force, yet remains confident that it would tear Felix limb to limb. Quote unquote. Here, supernatural clearly does mean a lot. The monster's physical accomplishments seem clearly disproportionate even to its usual stature. But they are supernatural only in, the, only in the older and weaker sense of the term. Quantitatively impressive, not qualitatively alien. In short, Frankenstein the novel is supernatural to the extent that it takes the form of a charmed world. The world in Mary Shelley's novel is clearly charmed. It's in a sense unnatural or rather supernatural. Its representative landscapes, for example, the far north, the high altitudes, the remotest corners of Europe lie beyond ordinary human experience. Humans are subject to limits, as Walton perhaps is in the Arctic, but Frankenstein and his monster are different, whereas picaresque novel, novels Travel roads and realistic novels, as Tendhal famously said, learn to mirror highways. Frankenstein's journeys are incipient or terminated, not in the process. Even Walton's adventure proceeds by seven league boots, with the epistolary form encouraging a record of accomplishments rather than enterprises. His first letter from St. Petersburg, for example, says, and I quote, I arrived here yesterday, these are his exact words in the letter. The second from Archangel says, and I quote, A second step is taken, I have hired a vessel and I am occupied in collecting my sailors, unquote. And the third one, where he says, I am safe and well advanced on my voyage, unquote. He thinks his power is unbounded, the very stars themselves being witnesses and testimonies of my triumph. These are his exact words. Eight feet tall is therefore comparatively nothing. Here in line with Walton's initial irresponsibility, megalomania meets child's play or triviality. The novel consists of situations and dramatic encounters. There are many of them, eliding labor and process and even sometimes rationality. The Gothic of Frankenstein is thus defined by its disjunctiveness. Whatever the consistency of the internal narrative, the story as a whole definitely lacks continuity. Its characters favor dark and enclosed spaces, 
or else they exist with a kind of a secret invisibility behind visible nature, like the monster much of the time, and like the creator in the Orkneys, where he is quote unquote ungazed at and unmolested. Frankenstein, Frankenstein's Gothic is in our world and yet in a sense out of it, and its temporality is likewise disjunctive, intermittent or repetitious, without growth and gradual change. The long months that Frankenstein spends in his library are as if out of time. To him, they are like a hurricane in a resistless and almost frantic impulse, like a passing trance, quote unquote. Yet he remains in communicado, that is dead to the world even in the middle of Ingolstadt. Presumably, Frankenstein must eat while at work, but all that we hear is that his consuming passion ate him. It's swallowed up every bit of my nature, he says. The materials in Frankenstein's workshop of filthy creation, quote unquote, are a kind of antimatter, some form of an antimatter, stealthily collected from the refuse of ordinary life. This world lacks what Kant calls reciprocity with the ordinary world, that is, while it may follow natural laws in its own right, it doesn't participate in an exchange of qualities with ordinary matter, and this is very significant. The monster is forced to rove at night and skulk by day, for as Frankenstein says to it on behalf of all humans, and these are Frankenstein's exact words, there can be no community between you and me. Matter and antimatter do not react in the novel. There is no inertia or resistance governing their encounters. Either actions misfire totally, or else cause work, causes uh, their effects with unregulated intensity. Frankenstein describes the monster's powers in terms of strength, but its strength itself cannot be resisted, and it's a resistance or a lack of it that reflects at some level an absolutism of the will. Hence, the monster isn't pure physically as Frankenstein insinuates a number of times, but pure volition. Alien to the material world, it takes no captives. Either it is reduced to a blubber at the first encounter, which is what happens to it emotionally, or else it is content to annihilate what it means. The book's effective axis is a matter-spirit relation, shunning any potential pun on jaste quote unquote, and lying perpendicular to the nature magic axis. So essentially, the predominating factor, uh, the gothicness as it were of the novel, lies in the fact that Mary Shelley makes Victor Frankenstein create a human being, or create a being, a living being, he may not be exactly human in the usual sense of the term, taking into account or forcing together refuses elements which have been diffused from the natural world outside. And therefore, since it is made out of everything that is diffused from the natural world, it had to be unnatural or perhaps supernatural because it did have certain powers which go beyond human ability. The other aspect of it is, in Kantian sense, Frankenstein's monster is a product of a clear violation of reciprocity that lies at the heart of the natural world. And this reciprocity, or its lack of it, is the reason why Frankenstein's monster, and indeed most of the incidents that revolve around the monster, is unnatural or supernatural to us. This is all that I had to tell you in my second talk on Mary Shelley's Frankenstein. Thank you.